Good morning, everybody. I apologize uh, for being a little bit late. First of all, I'd like to welcome Amos for heading the Institute in this very important conference and to wish you a lot of success. Anybody who knows you knows your seriousness and the way you take uh, things, even things that you didn't deal with in the past. And I can guess, I'm saying to you, Frank, that you did a good deal when you took Amos to lead this institute. And I want to thank you at this opportunity for the contribution to the institute. And it's a very important contribution to the comprehensive uh, philosophy of Israel in strategic uh, uh, subjects. I want to welcome Ms. Uh, Mrs. Fornoy, who gave us an incredible contribution, not just to the uh, strength of the United States in the world, but for the important uh, connection between the United States and Israel, and to the security of the State of Israel. Mr. Negroponte, that uh, has always uh, represented to me the uh, thoughtful as well as the uh, strategic thought, uh, the American. I'd like to congratulate uh, Itamar. Uh, Israel, thank you to all the distinguished guests who came here this morning. The headline of this conference, the challenges of security and looking for opportunities in a tumultuous environment, actually catches the dilemmas that uh, the Israeli leadership is facing in the middle of 2012. This is a very complicated uh, reality, one of the most difficult challenges that we knew in the past, but also opportunities, and I'll try to touch upon them as well. We are now in a um, crossroad, uh, not similar to things that we had in the past. And uh, we're talking about challenges uh, and uh, where we need decisions that we cannot underestimate their importance. These things are going to face us in the next few months and uh, years. The changes are multidimensional and uh, we have to respond both to the closer circles as well as the further ones also in areas that we're all experiencing for years like terrorism along the fences and the borders as well as a challenge that we haven't coped with uh, in the past directly and comprehensively if we're talking about uh, the nuclear uh, of Iran and what's happening in the Middle East today. These uh, challenges are very complex and every single day underscores their seriousness and the direct way in which they have an impact on us and on the State of Israel. What's uh, mutual to all of them is the urgent need to make decisions in an environment which is very vague. And this is the time for responsible and brave and sober leadership that can distinguish and find the right direction within this complex of all the events and to lead rather than be dragged, uh, even uh, facing oppositions both uh, inwardly and from uh, the outside and also to cope with uh, challenges. And this is the time to decide between very difficult alternatives and not between good things and evil ones. After 64 years of uh, struggle for our independence and sovereignty, we can say that the State of Israel is strong, very strong, and uh, most strong in the entire environment. And still, some of our enemies do not accept the fact that uh, we are here for to stay in this uh, area. And the IDF and the security forces are the real and uh, guarantee for the security of Israel to face any kind of challenge. The Middle East, uh, some of the regimes uh, collapsed, uh, others uh, still hold on and what uh, looked in the beginning as an Arab Spring is now revealing itself more and more as an Islamic winter. It's green, not as environment green, but as the religious green and the hostility 
of uh, companies and societies towards Israel is uh, uh, helping them to consolidate a common denominator. Maybe we're talking later about event that uh, eventually will turn out to be positive and promising. This is, of course, the wish of all of us. We would all want to live in an environment where we have uh, values of the advanced world, of enlightenment, of freedom and democracy, something that will contribute not just to the welfare of the peoples around us, but also to the security of Israel and its welfare as well. But in the immediate uh, and medium uh, range, there are all sorts of revolutions and very difficult situations, and that uh, compels us to be aware and awake and uh, not to go into stalemate and to fall into traps that are scattered uh, all over the area of various erroneous conceptions. As a Minister of Defense, I determine that anybody who thinks or says that the challenges and the threats, the way they derive from uh, the uh, picture today, that these uh, threatened uh, threats have uh, dwindled or reduced and that we should uh, lessen the investment of Israel security is mistaken because this uh, investment uh, anyway is reduced uh, as a share from the product and from the budget because these statements as if uh, the threats uh, at hand uh, weaken the cohesion and the effectivity of the hostility towards Israel, these are statements that have nothing to do with reality. As opposed to uncertainty, it's a bit difficult to anticipate what's going to happen even in days. Uh, Syria and the elections in Egypt, for example, because in Egypt uh, the results of the elections uh, surprised not just the polls but also the candidates themselves and it's still not clear what's going to happen in the second round. The peace agreement with Egypt is a strategic asset of the State of Israel. I am not sorry about one day out of the 35 years of the peace agreements with Egypt. Our position is clear. We hope and believe and demand that the peace agreement, together with the other agreements that uh, Egypt is signed on, will be maintained at verbatim and will be honored. As a first interest, I think, not just of Israel, but also of Egypt itself and the international community as a whole. Syria, the regime of the Assad family for a whole year is uh, uh, oppressing in a very aggressive and cruel bloodshed of his own people. The massacre of the children in Khule is, is an atrocious act. Uh, it's another example to this uh, massacre without any distinction and no mercy whatsoever. These events in Syria compel the world to take action, not just talk, but action. These are crimes against humanity and uh, it's impossible that the international community is going to stand aside. Yesterday we found out that the United States and Central European countries and Canada and Australia took action in order to take out uh, their official representative from Syria and I think this is a very important step in the right direction, very practical, but we shouldn't delude ourselves. I don't think that Assad uh, uh, lost an hour of sleep uh, last night because of those people leaving Syria and uh, more concrete actions are required in order to bring about that, uh, uh, that a reasonable solution will be imposed on the Assad family. And the international community has a difficulty to consolidate a capability to act. Even uh, in a very clear and unequivocal case, it cannot be clearer than that uh, when you bury these children with these pictures uh, to the eyes of the world, the difficulty to translate this recognition of uh, hundreds of millions uh, all over the world and leaderships to the, translate it into action and to unification must tell us something even on other subjects. It has to tell us something about the sobriety which is needed when you evaluate whether in fact it is self-evident 
like some people even here uh, tend to believe or to think or to say that if only we'll have the right conditions where it will be self-evident and clear that the world has to act, it will act. It is not self-evident and it's not clear. And uh, just as uh, somebody said justifiably, one of the uh, journalists, I think in Haaretz, <coughs> this to the Israelis uh, has to bring to a conclusion that can uh, be evoked regarding the evaluations, what and how the world is going to act, if in fact it will be beyond any reasonable doubt that we have to act, whether in fact it will be self-evident that the world, in such a case, of course, will act. Is it really so? These things are not in a vacuum because Syria is a senior member in the radical axis Iran and Hezbollah, they help on a daily basis in a practical way to things that are happening today in Syria and they reflect uh, the danger that we have out of this uh, unholy alliance. But above all the things that we see actually hovers, as I said before, the challenge of a nuclear Iran. In the public discourse, especially in Israel today, but also in the United States to a certain extent, a tendency to underscore controversies and uh, positions that seem uh, controversial between us and the United States and within us, with the people within uh, the public system, both the elected one and also the civil ones uh, and the various people from the past, from the present, even within the government. I want to underscore here today quite a few points of agreement. Today, as opposed to the past, there's a worldwide agreement, and to a certain extent, uh, we are contributing to this uh, agreement and its clarity regarding the real intentions of Iran. The Saba, um, um, the IIA, um, they clear, make it clear that Iran is striving to uh, reach a nuclear capability. The leadership of the world, headed by the American administration and President Obama, all speak in the similar language. A nuclear Iran is unacceptable. Iran from turning into nu nuclear power, where all options except containment uh, should remain uh, on the table. Iran, Garini. A nuclear Iran uh, threatens uh, the world order. And that is also clear. Everybody understands, nobody disputes the fact that Israel, the Iranian challenges uh, uh, something more uh, clear, uh, close and uh, uh, to our own being. And if a potential is going to develop in the future for an existential threat, then for Israel, as opposed to other countries or superpowers in the world, Israel doesn't have an option, and I repeat, does not have an option to avo ignore this challenge. The place we stand in the Iranian threat is much more significant, and in my opinion, it's also understood by everybody. We are convinced that the Iranians are trying to uh, lead the entire world astray and consistently to continue to strive to, uh, the, to breach uh, the uh, directives of the IAEA and the world. And uh, what they want is to buy time until they base themselves completely in this environment so that they will be able, if and when they'll make a decision, to advance and make that additional step towards creating um, a weaponry or uh, nuclear installations or maybe a, a situation whereby they have a capability within a very short time to become, if they wish to do so, to a nuclear power without anybody being able to intervene. There are a few questions that are asked uh, time and again and the difficulty to look directly to uh, very difficult problems that uh, causes uh, some stammering, some vagueness in the answers or sometimes uh, responses or answers that are not connected to reality. 
The first question is, why shouldn't we do the simple thing? We'll make a line in the sand, let's say a directive of Khaiminai to start uh, building an installation or nuclear weapon. And uh, after he gives such a direction, if he does, then we, there'll be somebody who says we have a year and a half or two years. It keeps changing and this is enough time in order to act. And I am saying that this will not happen. Why will it not happen? Because Khamenei and the others are not stupid. They understand that just as well as we do. And they understand that to date and in the past, they actually were exposed. If they make such a decision, then God forbid, if the sanctions and the diplomacy does not help, then somebody can just make a decision to do something about it and to jeopardize this advancement. Therefore, we see the Iranians. We don't have to guess. We don't have to evaluate. We don't have to philosophize in conferences or write articles in the papers. We see it with our own eyes for years on end. Today, the Iranians acting in a very calculated way and planned way in order to avoid the possibility to mark a line in the sand. Not that they're going to evade the fact that uh, we will know when they decide to go towards the nuclear weaponry, but of course they try to create a situation whereby at least Israel and in a surgery act uh, the United States as well will not be able to perform what I just described, namely the um, uh, centrifuges and uh, the multiple sites and the uh, uh, circumventing all the bottlenecks and all the machinery and this is side by side the accumulation which is growing of uh, enriched material on a low level today they already have uh, five plus tons of uh, enriched material um, in a low and more than 120 kilograms of 20 percent. These are already quantities that the first one is enough for four or five uh, such installations when uh, the enrichment ends up to 90 percent and the other one is about uh, ready for two thirds and they're still at it. And the centrifuges are, have got many, many cycles to go. This action is methodical and the Iranians are patient. They say to themselves, we waited 4,000 years until we have a nuclear power. We can wait another four weeks or four months or four quarters and nothing's going to happen if this is what is required in order to create a situation that we Iranians are convinced that the Israelis or the Americans cannot do anything uh, surgic, uh, sur not uh, with a, a hammer, and is it? But I'm talking about a real uh, with a scalp, with the uh, very delicate uh, scalp of the surgeons, and only when it will be impossible to do any such action, then the ayatollahs are going to sit with the Khamenei and they can discuss. But the one difference will be that then, when they discuss, we can continue writing articles and we can continue to talk in conferences and then it becomes a very interesting uh, topic and uh, historians and philosophers and uh, commentators but it will be no longer be a subject for decision makers anything concrete and anything that leaders can deal with the other question that comes up all the time and creates a vagueness is uh, that nobody wants to go to war, definitely not people who participated in wars and those who uh, watched from uh, the dress circle. Nobody wants to run to wars, doesn't want wars and definitely not wars with uh, huge uh, factors like that. But after having said that, we have to ask, uh, what does it mean, a sword on your neck? What do you mean when you say you have a sword on your neck? I'm saying, what's a sword on your neck vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conventional preparation? We know your opponent uh, acquires uh, weaponry and then it becomes operational. He puts these weapons and he wants to, uh, uh, to uh, exert them. And then you have no other choice choice bad to act and we thought uh, that before the six day war there was such a situation uh, some historians say that if you look at 45 years back then it's a 
question mark. Uh, I don't know if it was definite, but we felt as if it was a sword on our neck. But it's not similar when we talk about nuclear capabilities, because there you don't wait until they acquire the capability and they build it and they deploy it and they want to operate the uh, nuclear capability and then you act it's too late you cannot act and there's nothing more you can do and therefore the important moment is the last one uh, the metaphorical sword is now on our neck uh, I don't really like this uh, metaphor because Israel is so strong that even if uh, uh, all of a sudden uh, Saudi Arabia will have uh, some uh, atomic uh, bombs because there was something in Pakistan or anything, still we are not closing the state. Israel is still remaining the, mo the strongest country in the Middle East. I said to somebody once, it's not going to go without discussion. <laughs> and it's uh, nothing will happen but i am now uh, closing the parenthesis i go back to the issue at hand the relevant moment as far as a political decision is the last minute where you can still do something otherwise it really goes over to commentators and historians and that moment with great responsibility has to be located. We shouldn't run towards it. We cannot announce that it happened because of uh, somebody had this mood or another, but uh, we cannot shut our eyes and say, uh, out of uh, your, your uh, sleep, uh, you touch your neck and you don't feel a sword so you can sleep quietly. You cannot sleep quietly when the Iranians are going towards the point that after that Israel will not be able to do anything. And the third thing that I saw, even today, I saw a very important journalist who wrote, we are so concentrated on Iran and we forget uh, what can happen here. There's, nobody forgets anything. Everybody understands that that can happen. Yesterday, the prime minister spoke is the fact that you don't write everything every day in the newspaper uh, doesn't mean that we don't think about the other things. And, but it doesn't say, on the other hand, that we don't have problems and everything is perfect. All we have to say is say a word and everything is going to disappear. We live in the Middle East for decades and we know that you have to be with open eyes and also to prepare yourself and uh, preparing yourself doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect and the fact that you're not ready in a perfect way to anything that you can even think of is not uh, supposed to paralyze the leaderships from making decisions that have to do with the responsibility for the future and security of the state of Israel and then I hear the strange uh, complain that as if we don't deal with it. We're not discussing it. What do you mean we don't discuss it? I sit uh, 30 years with some breaks directly with the government of Israel since uh, the late uh, Begin. I was then the head of intelligence and I tell you with full responsibility that these 30 years there was nothing, not one issue in the Israeli experience, not in peace and not in war, not the Camp David of uh, Begin and not the Oslo Accords and not the Olmert uh, conversations or mine, nothing, not in peace and not in war, not in the first uh, Lebanon war, which today is almost 30 years uh, and not uh, the second Lebanon war. There was not one issue of a big war or big peace that has been discussed so much, so many years, throughout so many discussions and so many fora with all the people mixed together and everybody speaking candidly about it. There are controversies, of course, as well. But having said that, I said, first of all, calm down. Anybody who thinks that uh, everything will be great if there will be discussions cannot complain that there were not discussions. And people think that we didn't consult enough, don't think that we didn't. And there are no uh, secrets, not one pe person or two people, whoever was here yesterday or today, make a decision by themselves in a very darkened room in some uh, exaggerated uh, description that has to uh, play on the fears of people. I'm not going to say that the fact that there were long discussions and more organized uh, with more factors um, uh, the ensures completely in a physical, mathematical way that these decisions are going to be perfect. No, uncertainty is in depth in those things that we deal with and that's why you shouldn't stop thinking. But we can release yourself from the anxiety 
in your insomnia because people don't discuss enough we discuss a lot we even talk a little bit too much the prime minister and uh, my, me and Ms. Flournoy and people in uh, similar positions in the United States should speak from time to time all the rest it uh, really uh, should be encouraged uh, to researchers like here in this institute I tell you the some of the statements that we heard are not responsible not responsible and detrimental to the effort to stop Iran and limit the freedom of action even of the superpowers and of America and Israel. There is no disagreement over the fact that a nuclear Iran and a regional n nuclear and the Saudis are saying that uh, you should they shouldn't be surprised that we will be nuclear it will not even take us eight years or eight months I don't know how long it will take but you can each think and uh, see what it means and uh, uh, Turkey will have to be nuclear if anybody has spoken to the Turks before we reach the current situation with them uh, and uh, we may have to stop here the heads of the INSS so I think the yacht should uh, um, take uh, should sail by the by the shores and perhaps uh, we should uh, arrest the head of the INSS but uh, I'm only joking um, of course in this uh, topic uh, the general the head the general staff and Amos uh, who was also a, an, an Israeli Air Force uh, officer we will all stand as a rock, as a solid rock, behind anyone who is our partner. We have made the decisions. The political instances have uh, decided this, and then uh, they know about all the uncertainties with uh, what might happen if and should these activists, the IHH activists, uh, should strike. And of course, we are all standing behind the committee, the Palber committee, and the Turkel committee, and uh, Israel did the right thing in terms of the closure, and in terms of uh, the way the force was uh, struck, and uh, the developments were not developments that anybody wanted to have, and on that topic, in this matter, you'll be completely protected. But it's not only Turkey, it's also the new Egypt, as far as I'm concerned. I believe Egypt will find itself part of the nuclear race and the uh, countdown in the terms of uh, technological um, nuclear technologies going into terrorist organizations will not take long. Iran wants hegemony in the entire region and is in is motivated by an Islamic, a radical Islamic ideology and um, obtaining nuclear capacity will be a support for it and to give the uh, umbrella that is being opened over the Islamic um, forces in uh, Gaza and the forces that, inf that empower it in the region. Undoubtedly, when the United States goes out of Iraq and is about to also take its troops out of Afghanistan and starts to look towards uh, this uh, area, this region of the Mediterranean in the next uh, decade, if Iran should become nuclear, then action would have been more assertive and will intimidate its neighbors with, its, with their oil and gas resources, and they will have to align with Iran more and more in order to ensure their future and their freedom of action. And I'm fully aware of the need to cope with uh, the undermining of Iran in terms of military aspects is complex, and even the outcomes that are difficult to anticipate and foresee. But I have no doubt that out of this dispute that is, hap that is uh, being heard here and is also seen in the journals uh, of uh, various uh, organizations in the uh, United States and Europe, I believe that much like the others who say that is that as 
complex and difficult as coping with Iran today is. And of course, it is not without risk and it is not certain. Um, if we were to deal with this only in a few years, when Iran is already with nuclear weapons, it will be um, immeasurably more difficult, immeasurably more dangerous, immeasurably more complex and expensive in terms of the price paid by human lives and irregular. And it has nothing to do with uh, the, the price in terms of uh, money invested. And as for the disputes, whether we're talking in uh, inverted commas or not, I think that we are talk we are in a continuous discourse and in continuous discussions with the government, with the American administration. Obama's administration is very diligent and very responsible in its actions and also places sanctions, also uses diplomacy and prepares all the contingencies, all the operational contingencies to the scenarios, uh, the extreme scenarios of all types. And I must say uh, that uh, they are doing this to an extent and to a depth that we have not seen before and around the problem that has been accompanying us for the last 15 years. The security con contacts with us and the United States is at the highest level. Uh, the administration headed by the President Obama as well as the Congress um, and as well as personnel in the Pentagon uh, such as uh, Ms. Flournoy. Uh, we cannot even uh, over overrate uh, her contribution to the consistency and the stability of this attempt. And they are, of course, empowering us and strengthening us um, to a very large extent and very deeply to the security and the long term and the immediate range. Of course, we have differences in approach and uh, whether we think our clocks are ticking faster or slower, we think ours is ticking faster and some of our decisions uh, and conclusions are different. Uh, the differences are there and they're clear, but despite these differences and the different ideas of what should be done, they are also, um, they also understand that the Israeli government at the end of the day and the Israeli government alone is responsible for making the decisions and is liable and responsible for making the decisions in the issues that are crucial to its, to its security. And I will have to be cautious and say that to the security of the Jewish people, that after so many generations is mostly on this piece of land. Uh, is after so many generations, the, Israeli, the Jewish people is finally here in most part. And I think that we should integrate both politically and security the, the decision making. And we should maintain these special relationships with the United States, which is uh, the very, which, which is the most, our most important ally. Our goal is mutual. This is stopping Iran from becoming a nuclear country because it's everybody's preference, preference whether it, why diplomacy, whether by sanctions and whether by miracles from above, no option should be off the table. The uh, Iron uh, Dome is uh, being strengthened and uh, the fact that uh, the United States is behind us on this matter is another example of our relationship. These batteries not only defend our citizens but they also contribute to the det deterrence and they also allow us to be more flexible and make decisions more flexibly in terms of the military um, echelon and the political one. We have a system that is multi-layered and uh, it will continue on to the other projects such as the Arrow Missile Project. It will also save us some war. And that is why this is not only a technological achievement, it is also a unique operational achievement in terms of how quickly it was deployed. And uh, this is a very important issue in terms of our cooperation with them. We are, after all, in a diplomatic stage on the Iranian issue, and we would like to say a few things. We are not deluded by the talks. Like, like North Korea and Pakistan in the past, Iran will continue to advance towards military nuclear capabilities until it has threshold 
demands that are determined, such as stopping the enrichment and taking all of the material out of Iran, whether it's 20 percent enriched, whether it's 3 percent enriched, by the commission of the facility, the underground uh, facility in Qom, and giving an, uh, getting an answer about to all those questions, all those difficult questions raised about the components and the of what has happened in Iran over the past few years, and also in the last year, 12 months, that are. Giving, uh, rise, giving rise to questions in very uh, difficult areas. And until these questions are given the answer in a satisfactory manner and the answers to the IAEA are given, we will not really understand what Iran is truly doing. And these demands are crucial. Any demands that are lower will not achieve, in our opinion and to our assessment the goal of stopping the nuclear program and Israel and its leaders and me and I include myself will be the first and probably the happiest if this uh, uh, does not come true but uh, we believe it will not happen uh, just uh, by itself and we have to have our eyes open um, with a historical earthquake that has happened and the terrorism, and potential terrorism, the potential threat, existential threat um, that Iran, a nuclear Iran poses, it is our responsibility as the security system, the defense system, to have the answers even to developments that are not implausible. It is our responsibility as leaders to also have the attention and also have the resources and allocate those to build the right answer and the right solution to these challenges, the strength of our nation and the, our country is not only a military force or strength, it's a solid, it's a united uh, nation that is confident, that is based on values of respect, of, of uh, mutual trust, and uh, the, giving the ability to everybody in the community to to be the best of themselves, but uh, also to take responsibility and not only to raise a, a finger at people. And this challenge is a very difficult challenge we have been dealing with for many years and we are now ready to cope with it. This, uh, our society is the perfect society that David Ben-Gurion once dreamt of and we want to and this vision will complete our strength in uh, the military sense. We now have an urgent need to find an alternative for the Tal law uh, in terms of uh, who is in, enrolled in the, in the army. And uh, the defense system has proposed a law. I'm not going to go into the legal details, but we will say that the IDF will choose and decide how many of the 18-year-olds uh, per year will serve in the army, in the military, according to the IDF's needs and considerations, and all the others, whether they're ma male or female, will go to national service or civil service in the community for a limited period of time, and uh, let's say for about a year, and will later be incorporated into the labor market. Uh, those who are serving in their first year, whether it's all of them, maybe it's a third or two thirds, maybe it's a, a half and half, they will continue to be in the IDF while the others are already working and therefore there is no choice, it's not manipulations or anything. We, we, it's clear to everybody that differentially and gradually, according to the different uh, positions in the army and where they are serving and how many years and the capacities, but gradually and differentially differentially will reach a situation whereby those who continue to serve in the military for a second and third year will be rewarded in uh, to uh, that in a will receive a reward or a salary that is comparable to the minimal salary and that is because the IDF has decided that they continue and therefore they will be able to start their civil uh, lives later with the means to do so to go into the to higher education and so forth um, in order to uh, to avoid uh, the problems that we're having with uh, the yeshiva attenders then we were going to have the um, uh, defined number of people who will be going into the yeshiva 
Just like the Jewish world, it has athletes and has musicians. I don't want to compare between the two, but we definitely have uh, some people who are scholars who are really experts in a Torah, and they should be able to study. But this should be done in a maximum way, in the, with the maximum, uh, with the most attention. We shouldn't lose eye contact with our target, and with the right measure of deliberation and insistence when required. This matter of the Tal law that also that always looks complex. At the time I was prime minister when we started dealing with it in the attempt to find the solution, I was in Olmert's uh, government when they decided to extend it for a, a few more years because uh, at the time we didn't have enough time to talk about it and discuss it. It had to be lengthened and extended and now this is the right time to do it. We have a 94 MK coalition and we now have the time and the ability to uh, pass this law and it also gives us, because we have such a broad coalition, we are, have the ability to, uh, to force some people into our position and give us the tranquility to reach the decision and to do it through the discourse and in the disc with the discourse of, uh, with the other groups. Another thing that uh, has to be changed is the, the governing, the, the method of governance. These are all about all the maneuvers that uh, have uh, that need to have a broad coalition. We will not that we have not been able to do it because of problems in governance and translating the long term or the long range site into the short term action. Because there was no prime minister in Israel, it doesn't matter what a majority vote he had. Each day he is being voted or elected again, and uh, it's the same thing is true for the president of the United States. He knows that he knows exactly on what day of the year and which year his uh, fate will be decided. And just like an athlete in the Olympic Games, he, he needs to make sure he is fit on the day of the contest. So in Israel, we are walking a tightrope. The Prime Minister has to wake up every morning and make sure that nothing about his coalition, that everything in his coalition is intact and, he, and make sure he's still the Prime Minister. And it's very difficult. So we have to work towards this and the 94 members of Knesset that are supporting this coalition um, should go towards this and like Shaul Mufaz once said even if you have 70 who are opposing it's not a broad coalition but you can still um, pass these legislations and I hope that we will be uh, wise enough to do so and to establish a government with a prime minister that can be prime minister be in his capacity for four years and to strengthen this force and the strength of the Knesset and to strengthen the vote of the those uh, who elected us in a reality where those elected will be maybe regionally elected and to minimize the corruption uh, that uh, are that accompany this uh, primary election uh, situation. I wonder how, why these in, all these leading uh, research institutes are still so uh, um, uh, supportive of the primary election system. Everybody who is part of it knows how uh, corruptive it is and how wrong it is, and that's why the system should be abolished. I will have to say that there are some countries where the primary elections uh, uh, is, takes place on the same day of the general elections. You get two uh, notes or two um, ballots, and you, together with the same ballot, he also uh, marks the people he wants to see in Parliament. And in, on the both days, you basically don't have primary elections beforehand. It all happens on the same day, and this happens in various countries. And of course, they don't have the Jewish head there that has all the smart ideas. Uh, um, but I think I think that the real, uh, the right thought would be that if we go from the experience, we'll get to the practice that is much more stable and much more reliable than what we have today. And this is also the right time. And I think I will also go back to the point of the broad coalition because there is one more thing that it uh, enables and it's to do with the peace process. But uh, first I would like to say a few words about the budget. Again, we're in this cycle, this uh, repeated cycle 
In uh, our age of the, of the front rows, it comes faster than uh, the next cycle. But again, in terms of managing the budget, I believe that, um, that, having a, that going against the, the budget the, in terms of the security and defense, uh, the, these basic assumptions of the people who uh, principally supported uh, all sorts of budget cuts, there was some assumption there um, that the basis of the security budget is uh, led by the principles of the committee, which is maintaining, realistically maintaining the budget and growing it as a fraction of the uh, growth in the general budget, so that if the state's general budget grows by 2% because the population has grown by 1.5% and there's also growth in the economy, then maybe the the security budget will only grow by 1%. So, of course, it's every year it's the longest. Of course, every year we have the biggest defense uh, budget, but it's also the biggest budget for health and biggest budget for, uh, for education. Every year everything grows, and we shouldn't brainwash people into thinking. The question is, what is the percentage of the security budget out of the general budget? Is the, is the budget growing or is the budget um, diminishing? And the answer is that ever since I was the head of the planning division in the army, it has been gro it has, uh, going b diminishing by 40% or 25% each time. So despite the challenges that we have outside the, the circle of our control, the security budget keeps becoming, keeps being a smaller and smaller percentage of the general budget. And the a uh, growing factor is not the uh, size of the budget, it's the decisions made by the government. And in Israel, the share of the budget from the product is significantly smaller than that of the OECD. And not only is our GDP uh, realistically larger, uh, smaller sorry, than the OECDs, then we have decided, uh, because of what is happening with us, that we should be distinguishing between the various components, perhaps not, uh, the, edu perhaps not the getting to the school, but the quality of the education, perhaps not the getting to the hospital, but the quality of the health, and many other aspects, because the state has decided that it has to have the highest services, even though there's only 41% budget for it, while in uh, oh, the OECD, there is 43%. And I'm talking about 17, 18 billion shekel. That's the difference between 41 and 43%. And it's not like there's nowhere to cut, there's nowhere to do the budget cuts. And uh, there's always somewhere to make the cuts. And I see people here in the audience that are doing exactly that on their everyday basis. But I'd like to say there are a lot of other things to do as well. There are people who are exempt from taxes in Israel, not only for large companies that we have heard about yesterday or the day before, that we have to talk about directly, but also for the smaller companies. There are exemptions, there are high-tech companies in Israel, in Herzliya, and not uh, in the suburbs, that have started uh, uh, buying the land and they are taking uh, their uh, workers uh, to all sorts of places in Thailand for their vacations and they are still paying lower taxes than the cashier at the supermarket. And that's all historical arrangements because there are exemptions in the economy that are 39 billion shekels in extent. So if we only had uh, these uh, people paying taxes instead of being exemptions, we would have some more millions for other places. And people think that would be bad. People think that you can, they know where they, they can cut, but that nobody wants to give up on these exemptions. Why? Did it come up from the sky? Did it come down from, from God? Is it divine? So uh, we have uh, 150 or 180 billion shekels a year. If you can only imagine that half of this sum would be taxed with half the taxes that most of us are paying, then we would have 25 billion shekels more in the budget. And the battle uh, against these exemptions is not uh, impossible. Everybody knows where this is coming from. 
So there's a lot we can do, and I don't think this is true. I think that we shouldn't go back to the situation that we almost met with in 2006 and uh, do the same thing again. And I don't want to go back and uh, remind us that the security budget is a very uh, important lever to leverage the manufacturing. There are families in Israel who are, uh, who are supported by this. Um, it uh, generates seven to eight billion shekels a, a year. And, uh, and the defense system is uh, buying uh, in the periphery with la in large sums every year. And you can't, uh, you can't spend these shekels in North Korea. You can only spend the shekels here in Israel. And that's why the, there's here. And that's be and because we do have a recess in the world. We have people in the government who are still talking, uh, uh, quoting Hayek and and uh, others, and Milton Friedman, and all those things were true for the last 20 years, but they are now disintegrating, they are now melting in front of our eyes because the macroeconomic uh, re reality is changing, and unlike the last 20 years where the government was the problem and the private market was the solution, now it is the other way around, and governments are crucial, and even in the United States, uh, uh, there are uh, surveys and researches on the uh, Great Recess, and uh, we still remember their conclusions. But even Euro European governments now understand that this, uh, this uh, trap is very dangerous, and the government should, be, should have a stabilizing capacity. And when the market is working at an almost maximum output, then the government should uh, increase its demand and let the market work. But when it's the other way around, and it's vice versa, and we have a deep recession, then the government should take anti-cyclic action and so that the slope or this step that we must jump from is not made uh, sh sharper or more acute. So then the government uh, adds its own problems. Just like in home economics, you can't do anything that is not, uh, you can't do anything that is not part of what you earn. It doesn't happen uh, each year separately. If somebody is, uh, has cancer in the family this year, you can't wait for three years. And if a child wants to get married, then you have to do it this year. And it doesn't, uh, it's not something you can uh, um, wait with. And perhaps uh, we should have a, uh, con conference and what is the right macroeconomic approach. Again, about the broad coalition, we have now 94 MKs working together. I think this is an opportunity that will not repeat itself in the next year, few years. And if we now wait and do not act, it will be a delusion of tranquility, but we will get to the point where we have to pay the price and maybe some of the people who now prefer to uh, sleep or be in some sort of a comatose situation, They'll, they will then, when they will reach that point, they will say, how did we not know? So now we're going to say, so I will tell you now, inaction is not a possibility. We have to reach a comprehensive solution. We have to talk about all the core elements. We have to end this dispute and the conflict. But if it is impossible, then we have to think of an interim agreement, an interim arrangement, maybe even a unilateral action, because Israel cannot afford to be to stay in stagnation and we cannot find ourselves in a situation I don't want to repeat uh, the lines and the, or the, outlay, the outline but they are uh, this is what every we have a consensus pretty much about these and it's a two state situation we should have marked borders in Israel between the states and we should have a majority of Jewish uh, uh, population in Israel and we can have a Palestinian state beside us that is a realization of their dreams as long as the security issues are being well kept so we don't have rockets launched in our streets or long-term missiles and it will be a difficult decision to make but the time is running out and uh, just uh, to sum up I would like to say that the Middle East is changing and we now have to be even more cautious even more aware we have to be able to look each other in the eye and ask ourselves what needs to be done what needs to be done not how each of us is referring to the most original ideas and arguments but what needs to be done 
what should be done right and what should be done in a way that is really uh, you think before you leap and that is our responsibility as the as the defense system it is our responsibility as the government it has a huge responsibility and that is why it is also very unique and with this readiness and willingness to think and decide and take action that is what we will be tested by thank you